Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at Camp Butler. One time, a military encampment during the Civil War, then a prisoner of war camp, but most recently, the final resting place of more than 20,000 veterans and their spouses. Well, Michael Lewis, I guess the best way to sort of try to get our arms around Camp Butler mm -hmm. is to start in the older section. Right. And we're standing on sort of what would have been a knoll. Um, and this was the, the original prisoner of war camp. Yes. And the first place where there were burials yes. that took place here. Now, where we're at right now is, I'm told, was where, uh, approximately where the uh, hospital, hospital was. And the hospital uh, caught fire and was destroyed. And a lot of the records from that era were destroyed. Oh, then. that's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, originally, when uh, the, at, at the end of the war, or excuse me, during the war, President Lincoln designated that there would be 14 national cemeteries to bury the, the dead. And what he did, he, he allowed that each cemetery would be given uh, 14 acres for burials, uh, seven for Union soldiers and seven for Confederate mm -hmm. soldiers. And uh, here we started out with the, um, the, of course, the Union soldiers, and the conditions were really bad at the time, and so we had uh, a lot of deaths from sick, sickness at the camps. Mm -hmm. And now it's a, a, a wise tale that, of course, the, the Confederates prisoners were detailed to bury all the dead. They didn't want uh, the Union soldiers sitting on the headstones of the, their comrades, so the Confederate soldiers' markers have a point on them, and the uh, Union soldiers are around. Oh, okay. And, and there is a Confederate section yes, of this is. cemetery, which we're going to see right. later on. And so if, if, we, if we take a look to your, behind you, and we'll sort of scan over there toward the, the road. Uh, this, is, this is part of the old section, part of the uh, uh, Civil War section. Mm -hmm. And then it fans out as it would behind you. And interesting, you know, the, the history of this camp is very interesting. And we're going to look into that a little bit later in the program. But this gives us a chance to look at, at the way that the markers look from the oldest part of the cemetery. And then we're going to visit some of the newer parts with you mm -hmm. as well to see how burials have changed, uh, how oh, yeah. the markers have changed. There's a lot of maintenance that goes oh. into a national cemetery like this, yes. uh, including having to, to raise and plumb all these headstones exactly. on a regular basis. Yes, daily. D daily. Okay, yeah. we're going to talk to a contractor who's involved in that. And also, you know, the grass is so beautiful, but yeah. it doesn't just happen, no, does it? No, we have, a, uh, we have an agronomist that helps us set up a, a grass growing pro program. Plus I have a gardener that's assigned to my, my uh, crew mm -hmm. that uh, maintains the, the, the spraying and weeding of, of the grasses. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very involved uh, uh, process. Yeah, uh, and, then, and then there's something that you call turf renovation, which is a major job, right? Yes. And then we're, we're gonna see how, how, that, uh, how that happens too. Just so happens that right now, we're, we're in the process of two projects going on. One, the uh, raising realignment of the headstones, mm -hmm. and then we also have a project uh, that we are going to go in and renovate the grass or the turf. Mm -hmm. we, grass is called turf yeah, in the center. Yeah, right, right. But uh, what, we, what we're going to do is, uh, it sounds kind of strange, but we're going to kill off all the grass and then level out the, the, the turf or the ground, and then we, we uh, plant it with uh, sod grass mm -hmm. so it'll look almost like a golf course. Yeah. Yeah, and it is it is lovely, and and of course people expect that, yes. don't they? They expect it for their for their veterans and their loved ones. They expect perfection, and, and you try to deliver. Yes, well, my my job is to maintain this national cemetery as a national shrine yeah. for our nation's heroes. Michael, you mentioned um, the Confederate headstone and and the point at the top. That's how you know the difference. Well, that's one of the the, the examples. Uh, like I say, it, it, that was just a wives' tale. Uh, we don't really know that for sure, but it kind of makes sense. I've heard that before. Yeah, I've heard that before. But uh, uh, s some of the uh, other stones that that uh, were used to mark the Confederate graves were it was just like the uh, the Union markers. They were rounded at the top, mm -hmm. but instead of uh, the uh, the Union shield, they had the Southern Cross of Honor to identify the Confederate soldiers. Markers. What sort of uh, situation would have happened that a Confederate soldier would be buried here? Most likely he was a prisoner of war. Uh, he was captured and then brought here for, for the duration of the, 
this this the conflict mm -hmm. or until they they were negotiated a trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this is a this is a, a rather small section of the cemetery here. Yes. During during the uh, the the, uh, the the camp's history, there were there were about five thousand excuse me uh, yeah initially five thousand Confederate prisoners of war that were kept here. Uh -huh. Well, Marcus Thomas, this is the kind of work that people may or may not go know goes on in a in a veteran cemetery all the time. But you know the upkeep here, the the maintenance here is kind of surprising because these 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 headstones don't just take care of themselves, do they? No, we have to uh, go through and look at the ones that are leaning, and some that's been lowered from the weather. And we gotta go through and pull them out, put limestone in the bottom of them, raise them up, run lines, you know, set a couple keystones. We run lines from one keystone to the other, mm -hmm. and then we run our height lines so we can keep them in line. Right. And then we go through after we set them and we straighten them out if they, you know, one might be leaning a little forward, one might be leaning back. Mm-hmm. And then that's how we straighten the lines okay. out. Okay, what, you know. what are the guys doing doing right now? Well, right now we got, uh, when we fill them, when we dig them, and we fill the holes back up with limestone, mm -hmm. we gotta leave four inches from the top so we can put the black dirt, so we can put down grass seed so they can have their grass grow okay. back. Okay, so actually you're, you're toward the end of the process here where you've already, you, you've you found the level spot, right? right? Yeah. You've leveled these up yes, sir. And, and now you're filling in around it with this fine dirt yeah. and that'll be seeded then, huh? So, yes. you, so grass will grow up right around it. Yeah. It's interesting, you, you guys work for a company out of Dallas, Texas. Yes, we do. Huh. <laughs> so do you do some traveling? You go to other cemeteries as well? Yeah, we travel around, so like after we get done with this one, we go into Kansas. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty. That's so we go, you know, we travel from cemetery to cemetery. So. How often do you think these these will have to be leveled up? You know, I mean, obviously you've got them done now, but what, every few years or so? I say about every three to four years you want to come through and check them, you know, and see if any of them fell off level. Because with your, you know what I'm saying, like I said, with the weather, your rain, yeah. your snow. Yeah. And the sun. Freezing, you know, thawing, all yeah, that Yeah, it makes stuff. the ground, you know, it makes the ground move. Mm -hmm. So it might throw some of your stones off. Yeah. So like in three to four years, you come through and you have, you know, somebody just put a level on them, see if they still level. Yeah. Very interesting. But as interesting. far as them sinking, they shouldn't sink anymore. Right. Very interesting. Thanks for showing us. Appreciate no it. No problem. <laughs> Well, Michael, you're very fortunate. You've got a, a cadre of, of uh, veterans here who, who perform honor guard services at the burials here exactly. at the cemetery. And these, and these guys are all volunteers, aren't right. they? Right. Uh, we have uh, two regular groups, uh, the uh, Sagamon County Burial Detail. They come out on a regular basis. And then we also have the Macon County uh, Burial Detail that come out. And then uh, the families request uh, the active duty Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Now, uh, Camp Butler is really fortunate in that we have the Army uh, uh, burial detail that's uh, housed in the building with it, with our admin uh, personnel, mm -hmm. and they've done a fantastic job. Any time that a family requests uh, honors, they are right there to provide the honors. Sometimes these other groups have uh, overextended and can't make it for a uh, burial they'll step in and, and give honors for the veteran mm -hmm. at a minute's notice. Well, that's wonderful. And, and now the family for this particular service has not arrived yet. So this is actually to our benefit because we wouldn't want to get in on anybody's private affairs. No. But it's nice that we can see how often this is it's, it's used frequently. In fact, on the hour some days, yes. isn't it? Yes, it is. We, we, here at Camp Butler, we schedule on the hour. Now at some of the other larger uh, national cemeteries, they schedule every half hour, mm -hmm. but then they have double or triple the size of the staff that we have here. Yeah, yeah. But and, and they may have larger property, too. Oh, so, yes, I mean, yes. there can be more than one service going on at yes. a time. But you wouldn't want to do that here because it loses the intimate feeling and the, uh, the, 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 the feeling of respect, doesn't right, it? Yeah. Right. Um, now, we're standing in a section of, of the cemetery here. Most of these veterans would have been World War II veterans. Yes. And, and this area is full. Yes. And uh, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, at one time we had a uh, process in uh, the National Cemetery Administration where we put black lettering on the stones to make it easier to read. And over the years we found that it was just became uh, too much of a process and it also took away from the history of the stone 
And so as the sun ages, the lithochrome will fade out and it usually takes about five years mm -hmm. the lithochrome will fade out and we let the stone stay that way we won't try to blacken it again or, or add another stone mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. as, as as we move through this the cemetery I and mean, you'll notice that in certain sections there's a little bit more of the black lithochrome lettering that's in the newer section uh -huh. and as we go forward in the older section, right. they're all white. And, and you're not doing that anymore. You're not putting the black lithochrome no. in anymore. That, that was, it's isn't it interesting, there's an evolution to this just exactly. like there is with every other a form of, uh, with every other business. You also have, have experimented, or the, the VA has experimented with getting rid of the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, vertical headstones right. and going with a, a flat one, but people didn't care for that. Right, exactly. Uh, we, uh, we tried a, what we call a flat marker versus the upright marker and, and the National Cemetery Administration had become known for the white upright marble markers when the straight, uh, uh, yeah. straight uh, perfectly aligned and we tried uh, flat markers thinking that would be an easier way to maintain the cemetery and we found out that it's actually more work so, and then also the families did not like that type of marker mm -hmm. and so in order to uh, satisfy the needs of the or the want of the veteran and the family, we've gone back to uh, the upright marker. Now we will use it in in uh, sections of the country where the the uh, community does accept it. They do like them. Mm -hmm. Some places they like the flat marker, but most places want the white upright marker. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I noticed that, uh, and let's walk over to this tree over here. Oh. I, I noticed that in in most national cemeteries there are very few trees. Exactly. Um, but every once in a while, you'll see here we're sort of in a in a little grove of them. What what uh, what gives? Oh, well, uh, I'm I'm sure you remember from the old uh, westerns the 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 request that I want to be buried under the old oak tree <laughs> and uh, or in the shade of a, a tree, and uh, that was what we did. And th this w this is one of the original national cemeteries, so they were using that policy of burying people in under a shade tree, mm -hmm. or even planting trees in the burial section. Really? But we've, again, through evolution, we found that trees are not a friend in a ce cemetery, and the roots get entwined, and it just oh, causes yeah. all kinds of problems. So what we do now is that the uh, trees will be planted on the uh, edge of the uh, burial section. Okay, so and, you will continue to plant trees. Yes, but um, it'll, it'll, it'll never be in the section itself. Yeah. It'll be around the section. Yeah. And, and what have I, now we're looking at a, we're, we're standing under a tree right here. Mm -hmm. Now what, what sort of describe to me how the roots would, uh, w w the root system would disturb things here? Okay, the roots are going to uh, follow the path of least resistance and then mm -hmm. push anything that's in, in their way out of the way. And so the stone will be pushed to one side. In some cases, oh. the tree will actually grow around mm -hmm. and envelop the, the headstone. Yeah. Yeah. And in those cases, when the, when the tree dies, we have to cut the tree down. We have to also take the headstone out. And in mm -hmm. that case, we'll t we, uh, we don't re move the remains. We'll take the, the upright marker out and place a flat marker in its place. And we wait about three to five years for the, all the roots to die out, and then we'll put in an upright marker. Are there any any circumstances under which you would move the remains? Uh, yes, we will move the remains at the family's request. And in those cases, we have to get a signed and notarized uh, agreement from all the surviving uh, uh, relatives mm -hmm. that they agree that they want to have their loved one moved to another, another cemetery. Matt Gilmore, Michael Lewis was telling us how fortunate the area is to have a group of veterans like your group here who comes out and performs the honor guard services and, uh, you know, the volleys, the, the salute for the dead. Um, who are these guys? I, what, what sort of group is it? It's a bunch of veterans. Uh, to belong to the detail, you have to have a DD-214, honorable discharge, and be a member of the of a veterans group, mm -hmm. such and as VFW or the DAV. What, what is the name of your group here? Inter-Veterans Burial Detail of Sangamon County. Yeah, and you all are you all are all veterans and you're, you're volunteers, aren't We're you? We're all volunteers. We don't get paid. Yeah, you don't dog on it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we have, uh, we do it for free, but we accept donations. Yeah. So, a family, for instance, that's going to bury their loved one, uh, would, would, would a veterans organization take take their request and call you? Is that the, how that works? The funeral homes will call us, tell us where in Sangamon County or uh, out here, 
any place in Sangamon County will go. So you, if a, if a veteran's being buried at somewhere other than Camp Butler, you'll also provide those services somewhere else? As long as it's in Sangamon County. Yeah, isn't that That's wonderful? You know, we're looking over there at the shelter where, where a service is about to take place. Um, you all, right. did you bring the flags as well? Yes, those are our flags. Uh huh. And this is your, and you're the honor guard. You're the one. You carry the flag, and you'll take care of it after the service and is we'll over. Take as care well. of it. Yes. Um, you have. You brought seven guns with you. Right. Okay. How does that work? How does what work? How do, how, how do you, uh, what, what do you do with the seven guns? Uh, we have a about a ten minute program. Uh, telling uh, the what uh, in general what a veteran does, or what this veteran did. Mm -hmm. uh, not individual, it's just generic. Mm -hmm. And uh, then at the end, we, I turn around and say, prepare and salute our fallen comrade, the Sergeant of Arms. Uh, calls him to attention, mm -hmm. gives three volleys, 21 guns, I see. if we have 21 guns. Yeah. and. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Seven guns shot three times. There's your 21. Yes. Huh? Okay. Yes. All right. That's a wonderful, it's wonderful work you guys do. I, I think it is. All these guys are, you couldn't beat them. Yeah. They're here every, every time. And uh, they're just a great bunch of guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, Michael, at the, uh, at the edge of the Confederate section, there's an obelisk and it's a, it's a, uh, memorial to the uh, Confederate veterans. It says, in memory of the Confederate veterans who died at the Camp Butler Confederate prison camp, may they never be forgotten. And actually, they never are forgotten because every Memorial Day they get their due, don't they? Yes, there's a group of uh, Confederate uh, uh, reenactors that come out and uh, place a Confederate, the Confederate state flag on each of the Confederate uh, graves. Also, we have uh, Boy Scouts that come out every year and they place uh, an American flag on all of the graves mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. On all of the graves? All of the graves. Really, including the Confederate graves? Including the Confederate. Okay. Well, those Boy Scouts must be busy, huh? Oh, yeah. We, we get about, oh, around 300 of them, and they, they cover the ground like locusts. And <laughs> well, you, they must place, what, 20,000 some flags? Oh, yes. It's, uh, we have uh, about 23,000 burials here, but the actual, there's actual graves we have around 21,000. Uh -huh. Wow. Mabel Workman, you, you've been working here at Camp Butler for almost 20 years. That's right? correct. So you've come across a few articles, items from papers and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it has a fascinating history, doesn't it? Yes, it does. How, how did Camp Butler get started? Okay, Camp Butler originally was established as a training camp in the Civil War after um, uh, the, um, uh, the south of Fort um, Sumter mm -hmm. is when President Lincoln called upon the north to provide soldiers to help put down the in southern insurrection mm -hmm. as it was called. Um, Illinois did not have a organized militia and uh, so basically they all started out in each little town or community had their own uh, what they called rendezvous for the people could see their mm -hmm. troops training uh, for the war. And President Lincoln sent to the governor, uh, state of Illinois Governor Yates at the time, to um, send their fair share of troops mm -hmm. to help fight the insurrection. Well, the training camps weren't really considered adequate for the troops, so President Lincoln sent out General Sherman to look for a suitable place uh, for training. They did have one in Springfield called Camp Yates. Uh -huh. uh, it was in town, and a story goes, mm -hmm. that um, the troops were a little rambunctious. It wasn't good to have them in town. <laughs> get them right, out of town. Yeah, they said they were stealing chicken <laughs> and harassing the women, and, you know, young yeah. men just having a good time. Mm -hmm. So uh, they <laughs> thought it might be a good idea to have a camp with them, uh, okay. outside the city and, mm -hmm. and for areas to train. So um, when General Sherman came, uh, supposedly, the, and these are stories I've heard, that Governor Yates was from Jacksonville and he wasn't familiar with the uh, Springfield area. Mm -hmm. So he had uh, Mr. Butler, who was a s Secretary of uh, State, and, I'm sorry, Secretary of Treasurer, and Mr. O.M. Hatch mm -hmm. to assist um, General Sherman looking mm -hmm. for an area suitable for training. Why they came in this direction, I, I've mm -hmm. never seen, but they looked for an area where they had um, 
easy access, uh, water, and areas for training. Yeah. Um, and there was a railroad that yes, went right Yes, the railroad by right track was and right And it's not there. far from the river. No, in Sangamon yeah. River. Yeah and also the flat land. Mm -hmm. uh, they did also, before this, have a small uh, camp, Butler, by Clear Lake. I'm yeah. not real sure. I guess it just wasn't feasible for the area. Yeah. So uh, the flat ground, they said, was good for the Calvary and uh, the water for uh, drinking and mm -hmm. bathing. And so, and then the railroad to get the supplies in So, and out. so they, they opened this as a training camp, but mm -hmm. it wasn't very long, was no, it? That, that no. it actually got pressed into right, service right. for other reasons. Right, it was. And, and we've got this really great old photograph, and you might point out some of the things for us on here, because um, this is after it had become a, uh, a prisoner a prison of war camp, camp. Right, because originally it did not have a, a fence around it. Mm -hmm. Right. And in 1862, mm -hmm. when this photograph right. was taken, mm -hmm. you can see that it was a functioning, right. a functioning camp. prisoner right. of war because camp. Right. Because almost immediately when they decided to um, establish Camp Butler, and it was named after Mr. Butler, not there was a General Butler, and many people uh, ask if it was named after him, but it was not. Mm -hmm. And almost immediately they had troops arriving for training and it um, it was a busy place and Illinois did not have an established militia nor did they have any weapons in the arsenal so mm -hmm. the troops started training with sticks and they weren't issued um, weapons until they left mm -hmm. to go fight and for the cavalry they were um, had to bring their own horses uh, they were true volunteers so they were not mm -hmm. paid originally this is something that was brought to you Right. By, by somebody, mm -hmm. I guess a descendant of one of the... Well, I'm not sure. Some gentleman was doing research yeah. and he found the map and he brought it to this us. This is a map made by a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he drew this map and then when he was released from the prison after the war as soon was over, he went back to Texas. Mm -hmm. And somehow this map that he drew found its way to you. Right. And it's in good condition <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's really interesting because it points out the barracks, it points out where the wells were. It's mm -hmm. really kind of yeah, a neat thing to have, isn't mm -hmm. it? Now we were talking about about a, the, the 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 soldiers and their daily you know right, their daily right. and and you also came across what's called the headquarters of Camp Butler an order number which mm -hmm. lays out a soldier's schedule mm -hmm. right. throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, they got up at five thirty in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing they did was have breakfast. Well, they, actually, they did something for an hour mm -hmm. because they had breakfast at six thirty. Right. I guess they exercised or shaved or what? did something. And then they drilled and they drilled and they drilled, drilled all day yes. long. Um, until uh, until taps at 9.30. Now I'm just going to show that because mm -hmm. it's not a very good copy, but no, it's, it's interesting, not. isn't it? it? Is to get a glimpse into the mm -hmm. daily life of these guys. Right. They started early and went late, and um, they had a lot of work. And what I think is kind of interesting, some of the troops came up, and most of them came from southern, southern Illinois and central Illinois, mm -hmm. and um, they first troops had to basically build the camp. Uh, they got the supplies and everything from Springfield, but they had to build a camp. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of interesting in, for me, probably just because I'm a female, mm. but they came up and they had to prepare their own food. Yeah. And of course, most of these young men uh, never cooked in their life. Sure. So they had uh, issues with stomach problems. <laughs> they either had it overcooked or I undercooked. Stand my own cooking. Right. <laughs> so they were in charge of their cooking. But the hospitals weren't established yeah. uh, until a little bit later because they yeah. did have illnesses. Yeah. And, you, um, you have some luminaries who are buried mm -hmm. here. Um, one is John Catherwood, and I'm going to show a picture of him. He was very, very young in this uh, picture, mm -hmm. of, uh, but he served in the Philippines in 1911. What can you tell us about him? Okay. Uh, he's our Medal of Honor uh, recipient buried here and he was uh, received the Medal of Honor during the Philippines insurrection in 1911. He was in the Navy. His rank was called an ordinary seaman which mm -hmm. evidently was uh, the ranking they had at that time and he was on uh, a naval schooner uh, rather than like what I and everybody else considers these Navy ships mm -hmm. now and he was uh, on a um, patrol, a scouting party, and they were attacked um, on that, and he uh, valiantly fought yeah. and uh, survived, and when he came back, he was from Springfield. He was buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery, and his wife uh, decided that she would like to have him buried, and we did have a ceremony mm -hmm. uh, 
out here uh, with his uh, reburial here at mm -hmm. Camp Butler. So she thought this was the place for this him. This was the place, right. There's also a, a soldier named Otis Beverly Duncan, and uh, he is buried here, and he's also, was he from Springfield also? I believe so. Or from I'm around not, these parts, anyway. It, yeah, he yeah. was with, uh, uh, during World War II also. He was the highest ranking uh, African American officer in World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, he has his uh, uh, marker here at Camp Butler. He was with the uh, Illinois, um, I think the 8th Illinois was the National Guard unit. Mm -hmm. He fought in France. He received many wet medals uh, for his service. Mm -hmm. And, not to be overlooked, uh, the longtime superintendent uh -huh. of this cemetery, right. his name was uh, Major George William Ford. Right, Mr. Ford. And he, he was here for a long, right, long time. Right, 30 years uh, he was uh, the director here at Camp Butler. Mm -hmm. Again, he was the first African-American director here at the cemetery. And he and his wife also are buried here at Camp Butler. Mm -hmm. And uh, his descendants still live in the area, and they do periodically come by and visit. Uh, there are some that live in California, but they uh, come by and mm -hmm. see us, and we enjoy visiting with them when mm -hmm. they do that. Mm -hmm. so. That's wonderful. You know, this this building that we're in now, which is the office, mm -hmm. used to be a residence. It was right. the residence of the director right. or the superintendent Super for years <laughs> right. and years. They wasn't called it? it superintendent, now it's director, now right. it's cemetery administrator, so <laughs> now you go through t title changes. Yeah. But yes, it's built in 1908. Mm -hmm. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the directors, superintendents lived here until 1990. And uh, we just had one room that was the office, but mm -hmm. with the modern day computers, faxes, and uh, and the number of interments. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started here in 1991, we did 250 burials. Um, last year, uh, fiscal year, we did over 600. Oh wow! So uh, we are. That's the yeah. World War II veterans yes, coming of age, a lot isn't of them, it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They say oh, about 15,000 oh, a day. Yeah. Yes, so we have been extremely yeah. busy the last few years. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for helping us. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. With recent expansion of the property here, Michael Lewis says they have adequate grounds to serve veterans and their families well into the next century. He also says the public's invited to come out and enjoy the serenity and the history of Camp Butler anytime. With another Illinois story at Camp Butler in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. DVD copy of this episode of Illinois Stories, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois, 62708. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605 or by using our secure server by going online to networkknowledge.tv.